The great resignation is now turned into the great uncertainty. The red-hot job market of yesterday, with, uh, which gave employees great bargaining power, flexible work and opportunities, a plenty to choose and chain jobs at will, has cooled amidst recession fears and, of course, layoffs. From Meta to Twitter to Stripe and Snap, more than 50,000 workers in the U.S. tech sector have been laid off. That's according to a crunch-based tally. Now we hear that investment banks, entertainment companies and electronic makers are also handing out pink slips. Global corporations like Apple Apple are talking about holding back on hiring. Startups have let go than more than 17,000 employees in India so far this year. In fact, as per the professional networking platform LinkedIn, 9 in 10 business leaders in India believe that economic uncertainty threatens to wind back, and I quote, pandemic progress in the workplace. The ones who've received the dreaded email or anticipate receiving one are taking to LinkedIn to share their pain and support each other and also look out for connections. The power to demand seems to be on the wane. LinkedIn says it's the great leveling off after historic highs that we saw through the course of the pandemic. Recruiters are going silent on the platform with hiring down by 18% in India, 14% in Singapore, 15% in Brazil and 13% in the US. Across 14 major economies included in its global talent trends survey, hiring is down in all of them. That was even before Red October. The ones with jobs are staying put and LinkedIn says the share of global members on its platform who are changing jobs has dropped from a high of 44% in September last year to a negative 2% now. Now, all of this is the great reshuffle, says Ryan Roslansky, who took charge of LinkedIn as CEO just three months after the COVID outbreak. He believes this is an unprecedented moment in the history of work where all of us are rethinking not just how we work, but why we work as well. LinkedIn, too, I'm sure, is posing a question to itself. How can the professional networking platform with nearly a billion people on it shape itself for the working life of people in a post-pandemic world? World. Those are some of the questions we'll get answers to. Hello and welcome to On the Record. I'm Shireen Bhan and joining me today is Ryan Roslensky, the CEO of LinkedIn. Ryan, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 On the Record. Uh, and it's good to have you here in India. You're in Bangalore, your first trip as the CEO of LinkedIn. Uh, but I want to start by uh, getting a sense of you on what business confidence at this point in time looks like. It's shaken globally and it's shaken here in India as well. The war for talent clearly seems to be over. How much more pain do you anticipate on the back of what you're seeing happen on the platform? Uh, we just sort of read out a few highlights of your survey. How much more pain do you anticipate in the job market? Hi, Shreyan. First of all, it's wonderful to be here. I'm here in our Bangalore office uh, for LinkedIn, my first trip to India as the CEO. And yeah, what a vibrant labor market we, uh, we find ourselves in right now. You know, one of the things I've actually been paying attention to, which is why I'm, I'm here today in India, is running LinkedIn, we have a remarkable view of what's happening across the global labor market. To your point, you know, if you go back a year ago, it was a really, really hot market. And I think a lot of the, the trends, the downward trends that you see right now are really just indexing off of what was some of the heights of, uh, of economic growth uh, from a year ago. And I feel like now they're coming back down to more potentially of a, of a normal level. But one of the things I've been paying a lot of attention to, um, you know, kind of from that global purview, is that as it relates to a lot of the activity that's happening right now in India on LinkedIn is just fascinating. So India, our membership in India is over-indexing on networking. They're over-indexing on skills acquired and learning. They're over-indexing on job seeking. In fact, India right now is the second largest market in terms of engagement on LinkedIn. We have roughly 97 million members. And I've only been on the ground now for a couple hours here uh, in Bangalore, meeting with our amazing employees and some customers. And, you know, what I can feel like right now is though we may be in a bit of a lull. Where India sits in the next 10 years feel like it's really being decided right now. And this doesn't feel like a country which is just trying to create a playbook or figure out what to do, but a country that's actually really executing on a new path to economic growth. So I'm really excited to be here and just learn more in person. You know, that's, uh, that's good to hear, uh, Ryan. But what does that mean that in terms of uh, LinkedIn's plans for India, you have a fairly large presence in Bengaluru. Uh, are you planning to expand? Is this the right time for you to be able to do that, given the fact that India is strategically an important market for you? So what can we expect from LinkedIn for India specifically? 
Yeah, you know, we, we're on a, uh, a fiscal year calendar as a company, which means that we just ended our fiscal year as a company. We did a little bit north of $14 billion a year in revenue globally. That's growing about 17% year over year. But when we take a look at India, it's outpacing that. The revenue in India is growing at 50% year over year, north of 84% year over two year. We're closing in on nearly having 100 million members in India. But it goes well beyond that. We have offices in Bangalore, in Delhi, uh, as well as Mumbai. But we have a significant R&D presence actually here uh, in Bangalore, north of 700 R&D employees that aren't just building products for India, but are actually building out the foundation and a lot of features that power the entire global platform. And, you know, I can only see uh, a need for a lot more growth coming out of the really amazing work that's happening in this office. And so both as, you know, a market which is just going to keep growing uh, on LinkedIn, we're really excited, but also about just continuing to uh, grow our presence here in Bangalore as well with this amazing kind of R&D and go-to-market talent, which is helping us achieve these results right now globally. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan, uh, you know, at this point in time, what we are seeing across the tech world, including large companies like Apple, Google, etc., cetera, uh, either companies are laying off or they're putting a freeze as far as hiring is concerned. Uh, you know, this tech austerity, uh, does it impact your plans for LinkedIn, either here in uh, India or globally? Yeah, I mean, if you take a look pa over the past, you know, two, two and a half years, it's been a remarkable set of challenges to navigate through for any company, for any leader. You know, at first when COVID happened, it was unclear what was happening and a lot of companies pulled back. Then because a lot of things moved digitally native, you saw this huge influx of demand in these tech companies. I think rightfully so, they would scale up because of that. Right now, again, you're seeing a bit uh, of a pullback. This is all about leaders that are trying to really manage through and navigate these, you know, really unprecedented cycles across the board. Uh, as it relates to LinkedIn itself, you know, I'm really excited that when companies do decide that they're laying people off, that employees can turn to LinkedIn to find their next opportunity. They can leverage their network. They can search for jobs. They can upskill themselves uh, on something new. So it's really great to see that. I think through all of this, though, you know, for CEOs and leaders across the board that are navigating through a lot of these uncertain times, it's all about just ensuring you have the right leadership mentality. You're an adaptive leader through a time like this. I think the leaders can either be adaptive or reactive, but I, I think it's really important when there's this uncertainty that continues throughout the world to really maintain an adaptive uh, leadership position. I think adaptive leaders always play up. You know, when something bad or new or unique happens in the world, you have one of two choices to make. You can play up or you can play down. A lot of people play down. They play down to fear or the lowest common denominator. But I think the leaders that can really start to play up right now are the ones that are going to see the biggest gains. I think adaptive leaders also look at these opportunities, these changes in the market, as real opportunities for growth as opposed to maybe a tax or a burden that's being placed upon them. And I think last, adaptive leaders are constantly pivoting. I think that's what you're seeing a lot of these companies do right now. It's really important to keep moving and keep pivoting to make sure that you're changing your strategy to adapt for what needs to happen across the board. So I think that as long as, you know, at LinkedIn, we have principles around our talent strategy. Our strategies are always moving around. We have no plans. Uh, we haven't announced anything um, as it relates to uh, any kind of layoff or, you know, kind of across the board for our company. We, do, we have put ourselves inside of a, a hiring freeze right now for various parts of the company. But again, like every other leader, we're just continuing to navigate the global strategy that we need to keep the company going to create this platform that so many people are finding value off of right now. Uh, yeah, so no plans to lay off people, but a hiring freeze across various parts of the country. But Ryan, let's talk about uh, the shifts in strategy that you spoke of and several pivots that we saw corporations having to make through the course of the pandemic. Work from home was a necessity. And now as this great normalization takes place, the question is, uh, is that model uh, going to last what shape will it take? I mean, you know, Elon Musk has made it clear, come back to work or find yourself another job. Do you see that becoming more of a trend uh, as we move forward? Companies saying, come back to work. You know, some flexibility is OK, but work from home is no longer OK. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. We spend a, a lot of time, at least at LinkedIn, talking about the foundation upon which we build our company, which is our culture and values. And I think that this great period of, you call it a great resignation, a great reshuffle over the past couple of years has really been about this idea that every company, every leader is trying to figure out something new, which is how does our company work moving forward? Are we remote? Are we hybrid? Can people stay home? Do they need to come in certain days a week, etc.? And in fact, what these companies are doing is they're rethinking their culture and values. The culture and values is how the company works. For us, culture is you know, who we are as a, as a company. It's, our, it's the personality of who we are. It's also who we aspire to be. And all these things get kind of pulled together when you talk about, well, how does the company work moving forward? It's funny, I was in London last month with Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. And we were looking at some recent data uh, that Microsoft had published, which showed on one hand, 87% of employees believe that they're being productive remotely. On the flip side, 85% of managers believe their remote employees are not being productive. It's something that Satya called productivity uh, paranoia, which is you know, kind of this paradox of what's, of what's happening in the market. I think what's, you know, what's really going on and what we're seeing play out right now is if you're a manager, you used to do a lot of your job by walking around the office, seeing if someone was there, if they were in the office. That's how you knew if they were being productive, if they were getting something done. Today, in more of a hybrid world, it takes a different management skill set. It's not about just whether or not someone's showing up but it, you need to change your mindset. And I think that mindset is all about whether or not someone is being productive. You focus on the output, not just whether or not someone is in the office. I think some companies are gonna figure that out, some are not, but every company is gonna make this decision for themselves, which is gonna then attract that same set of employees uh, that care about that type of culture and values uh, into that company. So I think that what's really happening is, look, two and a half, three years ago, every company kind of worked the same way, and that's kind of how the world worked. Moving forward, every company is going to work different, and that's okay because that's where the talent is going to get attracted to. And companies that can attract talent with the way that they work and be successful are going to be great. If you can't attract talent or can't be successful in the way you work, you're going to be forced to adapt, which goes back to that adaptive leadership concept I was talking about a few minutes ago. You know, Ryan, I want to pick up on what you just uh, talked about, the productivity paranoia, and link that back to what we're seeing happen in the job market today, where the war for talent has waned and, uh, you know, the bargaining power is back with the employer and not the employee, which is what we saw through the course of the pandemic. Uh, you know, linking it back to what you just said about the fact that managers need to re imagine the way that they measure, uh, you know, outcomes in the workplace, is it going to then be easier to revert back to the old style of doing things, uh, given the fact that people are already questioning productivity and outcome? Uh, and today, uh, you know, employers will probably say, look, I can, I can get people to do what I like, as opposed to employees saying that we could have gotten employers to do what we like. Yeah, I think it's yet to be seen. You know, one of the most fascinating stats that I pay attention to across LinkedIn is that there's roughly 14 or 15 million jobs uh, posted globally at any given time. Pre-pandemic, that number was uh, roughly 1% of all jobs posted on LinkedIn were remote jobs. Uh, roughly, you know, six months ago, that number was 19%. 19% of all jobs posted on LinkedIn were remote jobs. Today, that number has come back down and is leveling out around 15%. So let's assume about 15% of all jobs listed on LinkedIn are remote jobs. Now, what's fascinating is that 50% of all job applications are to that 15% of remote jobs. So there's still this demand in job seekers and employees who are really seeking out remote work. I think that companies that can figure out how to navigate and manage effectively with the hybrid workforce are most likely those that are going to be effective. And this is really important to understand that, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Certain companies, maybe you manufacture a good, like you have to be in office. You know, if you're a healthcare company, if you're a hospital, you have to be physically there. It's just a period where we're going from everyone kind of worked in a similar way and work norms existed to now every company and every leader 
He's just going to have to figure out how to do that. That's what leadership is all about right now. That's what adaptive leadership is all about right now. On that note, we'll take a break here, but continue our conversation with the global CEO of LinkedIn on the record when we return. Welcome back. You're watching On The Record. We're in conversation with the global CEO of LinkedIn. Ryan, what I want to understand from you is uh, on the back of the survey that you've done, you know, what is going to hit the hardest? Uh, companies are now talking about either laying off people or going in for a hiring freeze, but they're also cutting back perhaps on budgets that had been allocated for things like employee well-being, uh, you know, wellness programs, skill programs, upskilling programs, etc. Where else do you see the impact of this uncertainty playing itself out? You know, on one hand, I think we're going to see companies hiring less uh, externally, and we're, we'll see that through a period of time. But what that does uh, is, is really puts much more of an emphasis on ensuring that the employees that are working inside of your company are working on the right things. I've been focused a lot on ensuring that through our platform and even globally across the labor market, that we start to move the currency that matters for efficient labor markets, even inside of a company, to a skills-based approach. What the actual job entails to do and what someone actually needs to know in order to be effective at that job. We used to you know, really just judge talent based on someone's degree or where they used to work or who they knew. But right now, with the market moving so fast and roles being created or replaced at such an unprecedented rate, I think this focus on skills in order to ensure that your company is working effectively is going to be the key. I said last week that, you know, in a lot of cases, your best next employee is probably going to be your current employee. But you can get there to figure that understanding by really focusing on a skills-based approach. So I think that companies that embrace this right now are going to find a lot of success moving forward in terms of ensuring their companies uh, and their employees are working on the right things to ensure productivity and successful strategies moving forward. Uh, Ryan, uh, you know, what does all of this mean in terms of wages? Through the pandemic, we saw, on account of the war for talent, wage inflation. I mean, every company that we spoke to, and tech companies in particular, spoke about the impact on margins because they just had to hike salaries significantly to either retain or draw in fresh talent. Uh, given the uncertainty that we're seeing, as well as the, the trends in the job market, uh, how much do you expect wage inflation to cool off? I think this is another thing that is going to vary on a company by company basis and industry by industry basis. Uh, but again, I think that over time, we can find a lot of efficiency. We can find a lot of equity across the labor market, both globally and inside companies, with more of a skills based approach where the currency that really matters in understanding where we should be investing more heavily is really based on the skills that are required to make the company more successful. Right now in India, for example, that's a lot of technical skills. We know the most in-demand skills across India, the top five skills are all technical in nature. And you know, I start to see, and I think we're going to keep seeing, a lot more people focusing on those technical skills as the path to opportunity, and thus the path to companies being able to understand what they can afford and will they be paying moving forward. Um, Ryan, uh, what about gender parity as well as opportunities opening up for women uh, here in India as well as globally, given the changes that we are seeing and also given the demand for technical skills, as you pointed out? And, and there again, uh, you know, uh, in many ways, the gap perhaps is being widened because women are not necessarily getting the training that they require for jobs of the future. That's something that the World Economic Forum has cautioned about. Uh, what are you seeing uh, on, uh, on those uh, trends that the survey is picking up? Yeah, and a lot of that data the World Economic Forum is using, um, you know, it, it comes from the LinkedIn platform that we, that we helped understand and provide. But look, I think, I think what you're saying is spot on. What if you have all of the aptitude? What if you have all of the talent? What if you have all the skills that are necessary, but maybe you didn't grow up in a high-income neighborhood or didn't go to the right school or don't know the right people. Uh, there absolutely exists this 
you know, this difference where where people are starting from. And we really care across the LinkedIn platform to try and create an equitable labor market uh, as much as possible. We do that through our products uh, by allowing people to self-ID uh, in terms of who they are. We do that through our algorithms to try and ensure that we're creating an equitable experience for people who are looking uh, for talent. We do it inside of our company by really focusing on ensuring we're building a diverse uh, and equitable workforce across LinkedIn. We do it on our platform through a concept called the Plus One Pledge, where you know, we ask everyone just to try and help someone else out, someone else that maybe didn't have the opportunities that they would have to find that opportunity just by making one connection with someone else, maybe opening a door for someone towards that connection to turn you know, uh, you know, a potentially you know, bad situation into an amazing situation that someone, for someone who didn't really have access to those opportunities. So you know, I think the data exists. We're going to help you know, keep providing what we see uh, across the platform. But we really want to focus on the power of LinkedIn and what we can do and what we can build through access to skills, through access to you know, equity, to create the most equitable labor force we can globally. Uh, uh, Ryan, you spoke about your conversation recently with Satya Nadella, and you know the, the, it's been a milestone year for the company. Uh, last year, when you touched the 10 billion mark, and of course now at 14 billion. And I remember that uh, Satya was asked many questions about the price uh, that they paid for LinkedIn, and I guess it's all worked out uh, uh, at this point in time. But uh, you know the joint vision as far as where you would like to see LinkedIn. What's that conversation with Satya about? Well, you know, when, when Microsoft acquired LinkedIn, we were doing just north of uh, $3 billion a year in revenue. And to your point, we've just crossed the, the $14 billion month, uh, mark on the, on the past 12 months. Um, I think Satya had a, a tremendous vision, which was we're going to keep LinkedIn as a standalone company. Uh, if LinkedIn needs things to grow, LinkedIn can have access to those opportunities from Microsoft. Uh, but we're going to keep LinkedIn standalone. And, you know, I think when we go back, uh, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. How is this going to work out early on? But I think that he saw something uh, really valuable, which is that while LinkedIn, you know, we contribute uh, a lot to, you know, the vision uh, of Microsoft, um, if we don't have to worry about the pressures of being a standalone public company, if we can just focus long term on building the right products, the right platform, getting the right opportunities in front of our members, we're going to see that growth happen. If we don't have to worry about a lot of the things that standalone public companies do, we're going to enjoy success from it. And he was spot on. And that's what's led to a lot of the growth uh, across LinkedIn. And the more that we keep seeing the success, the more that vision that Satya had for this independent model just keeps building upon itself. So. I feel very fortunate to be able to, um, you know, sit in Satya staff meetings every week and learn from, you know, what I believe to be probably, you know, the greatest executive team in technology ever assembled. And all that is really helping us build LinkedIn into what it can be and what it, it can accomplish inside of the Microsoft uh, umbrella. So I think, you know, a decade from now, We'll look back on this acquisition as quite possibly one of the most successful acquisitions in technology, uh, and Satya really had that vision from day one. You know, I'm going to end, Ryan, by, by talking to you not about LinkedIn, but about Twitter. And I was looking at your Twitter timeline, not very active. Uh, there's two posts this year, uh, and prior to that, 2018. So well, you've got a blue tick. Are you going to pay the $8? You know, I, uh, I don't know much about what's happening over there besides what we see uh, in the press. Um, but I think we can all root for the fact that a valuable, healthy Twitter is, is something good for the world. You know, I've been leveraging LinkedIn is the, is the main way that I like to talk about uh, how I share uh, and I share my knowledge to the world professionally. And I want to keep focusing on ensuring LinkedIn is the best platform in the world in order to do that. Ryan, always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. We wish you and LinkedIn the very best of luck here in India and globally, and we'd look forward to seeing you back again soon. Great. Thank you, Shreen. Well, that's it then on this edition of On the Record. From all of us here, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. There's a lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere.